Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Updates on Primary Aldosteronism Screening and Use of Direct Renin. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. To learn more, visit diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Brandy Gonzalez, Pathology Laboratory Utilization Manager, Special Testing Manager, Physician Laboratory Consultant, Director of Specimen Referral, and Adjunct Assistant Professor. Dr. Gonzalez, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining on uh, this topic. This topic is uh, it, it's near and dear to me. It is highly under-recognized, and you're going to get to see that in this presentation. We're going to talk about primary aldosteronism and the use of direct renin concentration. Disclosures, uh, I do receive a compensation for speaking engagements from Diasorin, Inc. So the objectives today, today we're going to talk about uh, the RAS system or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and how that system controls hypertension and how it, it also in causes the increase of your high blood pressure and causing uh, hypertensive disease. We're, by the end of today, you're going to be able to describe and understand key differences between plasma renin activity, or PRA assays, and the direct renin concentration, or DRC assays. And then finally, we're going to talk about some age-specific cutoffs for screening for primary aldosteronism using the direct renin concentration assays. So first, let's talk more about the RAS system. So this RAS system is very critical when you're talking about regulating both blood volume and overall blood pressure. What this system does is it works to elevate blood pressure when it's noticed a decrease in the renal blood pressure, when there's been a decrease in salt delivery to the distal convoluted tubules, and then also when there's medications have been given to purposely decrease blood pressure. So yes, when you're taking medications to decrease blood pressure, your body is in a sense also still trying to counteract those. And these different beta agonist med medications here are working to decrease your blood pressure more than what the RAS system is doing to increase it. So let's review the RAS system just a little bit. When your blood pressure falls, it triggers the kidneys to release renin. Renin then takes angiotensinogen and breaks it down into angiotensin 1. The angiotensin 1 then works with angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE to then create angiotensin 2. Now the angiotensin 2 does a couple of different things. Angiotensin 2, 1, causes your arterioles to constrict. That begins to increase the blood pressure. Angiotensin II also then triggers the adrenal glands to release aldosterone and vasopressin. Vasopressin is also known as ADH or antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland. So these things then also increase your blood pressure by causing sodium retention. So you're looking at that we're not only is angiotensin II causing the arterioles to constrict, but that it's triggering other downhill effects 
that are making you retain more sodium and then raise your blood pressure. All of this constitutes why we end up with hypertension. We end up with this higher blood volume, higher sodium, and this causes chronic cardiovascular disease. So why does this matter? So, well, primary aldosteronism is highly under-recognized cause of hypertension. Most people go, I haven't even heard of primary aldosteronism. What in the world is this? Well, the problem is, is that most medical education, I mean, even our, you know, what we're teaching our med students and physicians, they think that PA is extremely rare, and it's not. It is highly underdiagnosed, and people don't even realize that it exists. In 2006, there was the primary aldosteronism prevalence in hypertensive, or the PAPY study. And this study had a little over 1,100 patients that were recruited, and they identified that 118 of those 1,100 hypertensive patients had primary aldosteronism. So that was a 10.5%. When you're looking at things, 10.5% of your hypertensive patients, that is an insane amount of patients when you extrapolate that to the general population. Now, there were some issues in this study. It was only 1,121 patients. So you, when you're talking about hypertensive, you really need larger studies to make that kind of extrapolation. And you need to look at it across multiple different cultures as well. But that is still a large number of people. And when you're looking at the types of primary aldosteronism they had, 59% had adrenal hyperplasia and 41% had an aldosteronoma, which is a, a, a tumor form. Other studies report a prevalence in the hypertensive populations anywhere from 3 to as high as 32% of all hypertensive patients. Now, there is a big problem with the research that's going on in primary aldosteronism, and that's because they, they're very small. This 1,100 patient study is actually one of the larger ones that's been done out there. Most studies on primary aldosteronism have been exceedingly small and therefore can't really extrapolate to the larger population very well. And part of this is because people think it's rare. And so there's not a lot of funding and there's not a lot of money to really determine what is the extent of primary aldosteronism in the hypertensive community? So since it's under-recognized, it's also commonly missed. There was a cohort of 4,660 patients with resistant hypertension, and only 2.1% were even screened for primary aldosteronism. So if you're looking at between 3% and as much as 32% potentially have it, but only 2% are being screened, you have a very large segment of the population that has an undiagnosed condition that can be treated. Patients with primary aldosteronism have higher cardiovascular mortality, they have more cardiac events, and need to be treated more aggressively than non-PA patients when it comes to controlling their hypertension. The Primary Aldosterone Foundation, which is a patient-driven foundation regarding primary aldosteronism, they have a current estimate of about 3.3% of all hypertensive patients have PA. You know, well, 3.3% doesn't sound like a lot, but if you look at the entire population of the United States, all of those states that are in red, that would equal 3.3% of the population of the United States. So that six states population would be misdiagnosed. That amount of people, you're talking about an insane amount of people that is being misdiagnosed as just regular hypertensive patients. Now you think about what happens when a patient presents to their physician with hypertension. They get sc screened with a blood pressure cuff. Oh. You have hypertension, so what do they do? Well, we're just gonna throw you some medication and let's see how it does. And they're not even taking the next step to screen for primary aldosteronism, which is a very different treatment. So what are the different forms of PA? 
Well, there's two most common forms. About 60% of patients are going to fall into this bilateral adrenal hyperplasia or BAH. 35% are going to fall into this uh, tumor-like uh, aldosterone-producing adenoma, which does require surgery to fix. The other 5% are more or less common. You've got this unilateral adrenal hyperplasia, the familiar forms, and there are five different genetic subtypes of these, adrenal cortical car carcinoma, and then you've got these ectopic aldosterone-producing tumors, endocrine uh, malignancy type things. So there's many different subsets of PA, but the two most common are your bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and the aldosterone-producing adenomas. So since we're not screening for it, what should physicians really do when they get that first, that blood pressure reading and they're diagnosing their patients with hypertension? Well, before they put them on any medications, they really should be getting an aldosterone in renin concentration, also known as ARC. This is the best way to measure and screen for PA. It's best to do it before starting any therapies, even changing diets. So you don't want your patient to change their diet and go on a sodium restrictive diet because that can also interfere with all of the testing. There's two different methods currently available for measuring renin as part of the aldosterone renin ratio. There's the old school way, which is plasma renin activity or PRA. And then there's the new school way. And this is the direct renin concentration, or the DRC. Overall, both are being poorly utilized. Both are highly underutilized. This testing should be done during that first appointment where hypertension is diagnosed. But why? Well, as I said earlier, you know, in medical schools, they're teaching physicians that this is a rare disease, but it's not. It's not that rare. So there's really poor education regarding both primary aldosteronism and thus poor education regarding plasma renin activity and direct renin concentration. And since there's poor education about all of it, then that leads into misinterpretation of these tests which also leads into a more mis- and underdiagnosis of PA. You see where I'm going? It's a domino effect here. So let's break down the differences between plasma renin activity and direct renin concentration. So plasma renin activity, this is, remember, I called it this the old school test. It's the tried and true, kind of considered the gold standard. This is usually a competitive one-site immunochemiluminescent assay. Yeah, say that three times fast. But it uses a biotinylated monoclonal antibody. Biotinylated. That word came really big into laboratory medicine a number of years ago. Why? Because any assay that is biotinylated reacts to biotin as biotin interference. This, the plasma renin activity, it reports as nanograms per milliliter per hour, or overseas, nanomoles per liter per hour. It is highly labor intensive and highly time consuming to perform. Anything that you're gonna have labor intensive, you're gonna have variations between the technologists, the scientists that are performing this test. And because of this, you have a high variability between labs. This variability has an interlab CV of about 35.4%. So the result that you get at one lab could be as much as 35% different from another lab, strictly because of this labor intensive process. So what about direct renin concentration? Well, it's typically a sandwich immunochemilucent assay using monoclonal antibodies. Notice the units are different. It's either a micro IUs per milliliter or nanograms per milliliter. So the PRA is added the per hour 
and that is not on the direct rented concentration. Direct rented concentrations tend to be automated. They tend, they are much faster. They, not that they tend to be, they are. They are much faster than plasma rented activities. And the direct rented concentration is standardized to the WHO IS standard 68356. Currently, the reported inner lab variability on the DRC is only 7.5%. So when you're looking at these comparing the PRA to the DRC, you've got less interference, it is much faster, less labor intensive, less time to perform, it is standardized, whereas the PRA is not standardized, and thus your variability between labs is much lower. The big sticking point here is you need to look at the units. The units are vastly different, which means you cannot compare results from one to the other. You cannot compare aldosterone renin ratios using plasma renin activity to aldosterone renin ratios using direct renin concentration. You cannot compare them between each other. You have to look at them independently. So which one is better? Well, studies are now showing that the DRC is not inferior to the PRA and it's more practical to perform. So yes, currently the PRA is, still has that gold standard status, but we know that those things do not get updated very often. The studies are showing it is not inferior. The studies are sh showing that it is much easier to perform, it is less time consuming. However, you do have to watch on the interpretation. You have to do your physician education when you do any switch from PRA to DRC, because you cannot compare the two different, completely different units of measure. That's because they're measuring two completely different things. One is measuring the actual renin concentration, the other one is measuring the activity. So you must have method-specific reference intervals for renin, and you must have method-specific aldosterone renin ratio reference intervals as well. So what I'm going to show you now is when my own facility brought in direct renin concentration. And this was a comparison, this is just a snippet of the education that went out to providers. You see the old test, which is the plasma renin activity, and what the reference intervals were for that. Notice the nanograms per milliliter per hour. The new test or the direct renin concentration and those we report in picograms per milliliter. And then the ratios. This is the new ratios that we're using at our facility with less than 10 primary aldosterone is an unlikely and greater than or equal to primary aldosteronism is probable. Remember, this is a screen. This is not a confirmatory. This is a screen. With all screens, you're going to have something that is highly, highly sensitive, but not really specific. So you want to make sure that you do not make diagnosis strictly from the aldosterone written ratio. You need to follow up any abnormal tests from that. So what about age, oh sorry, it's there. What about age specific cutoffs for the aldosterone renin ratio? So this changes throughout our life, these levels do. And the problem that we've run into is that lower ratio cutoffs are really have high sensitivity and decent specificity in the younger populations. But as we get older, that specificity gets lower and lower and lower. Well, that becomes a problem because as we get older, the rates of hypertension increase. The older, the more likely that we're going to have high blood pressure. 
as the population ages, the more likely that you're going to see hypertension in that population. So there's not a whole lot for lower cutoffs there you're going to miss. Well, let's talk about, well, if we do higher ratio cutoffs. You have a low sensitivity, but really high specificity in the younger population. What about the older? Well, you still have high sensitivity and you have eh, decent specificity in the older population. So you're, you, you've got these, this uh, trade and cutoff. It's a catch-22 situation. What, what do we do? So age-specific cutoffs helps to optimize this issue. But then the question is, how many age ranges should we really have? Now, if you remember a couple slides ago, I'm going to go back a couple slides. We have, at my facility, we started off with, with two age ranges. We have the 18 to 39 years, and we have the greater than or equal to 40 years. But there's some studies out there, let me move forward, here we go. A 2018 study, they looked across four separate age groups. So they looked at the less than 40, the 40 to 49, the 50 to 59, and then greater than or equal to 60. And as you can see, when you're looking at that aldosterone-renin ratio, and this is using the direct renin concentration, that the sensitivity and specificity definitely changes with age. So should we have more subgroups? Should we have our subgroups of not just greater than 40 and less than 40, but should we really have the 40 to 49? the 50 to 59, greater than equals 60? Should we have 60 to 69? Should we have 70 and older? We don't really know. And while we're talking about it, we don't even have pediatric ranges. Or if we go back to the previous slide, da -da 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 -da. even at my own facility right now, we're only down to 18 years of age. We don't have pediatric reference ranges. You go, well, it's pediatric. They don't have hypertension. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. We're seeing more and more, especially teens with hypertension, and even younger with hypertension. Look at our good old American diet. I know I'm in the South, and we fry everything, so everything is full of loaded and salt, we're seeing more and more hypertension in younger and younger patients. So should we really have age groups, not just less than 40, but maybe 30 to 39, 20 to 29? Should we have, say, 12 to 17, 5 to 11? We really don't know. We haven't done the study. We don't know what we really should have as far as those age ranges. Now here at my own facility, we not only have the ad uh, adult hospital, but we also have Children's Hospital of Georgia, and we're starting to collect that data. But for any of you that work with pediatrics um, may know is that you don't really have a whole lot of leftover specimen on your peds patients. So uh, it's gonna take a little bit for us to, to do this, and, and hopefully we'll see, you know, what is, a reference range that we should have for these on our pediatric patients. What would be the cutoff to determine that they have primaldosteronism? Having that cutoff earlier can get patients treated earlier and you can prevent cardiac issues later on. We're seeing cardiac issues in 20 and 30 year olds now. This is something that us as laboratorians, we really have to look at and we really have to consider. So remember, aldosterone renin ratio, that is your screen. So what do we do to follow up for abnormal screening? Well, there's several different types of tests that you can do to follow up on an abnormal uh, concentration, um, aldosterone renin concentration screen. You've got your oral sodium loading test, which is probably the easiest one to do because a patient can do it as an outpatient and just come in for the draw. You have your saline infusion test. 
And then you've got some other ones that can do as well. But basically, anything that would stimulate the various aspects you can use, the various aspects of the RAS system you can use to confirm abnormal screenings. Now, mind you that the confirmatory testing can be skipped, and you can go straight to adrenal imaging, your radiology tests, and diagnostics if the patient's had spontaneous hypokalemia, if that aldosterone is greater than 20 nanograms per deciliter or greater than 550 picomoles per liter, or if the PRA or DRC is practically undetectable. A couple things you do need to look at when you're looking at that last one, the very low and undetectable. If the patient has already gone to a very low sodium diet, you may already have the very low or undetectable PRA or DRC. So just mind you that you, to, in order to use that uh, criteria, the patient needs to be on a, a regular diet. So what is the testing algorithm here? So you start with the adrenal renin ratio. And if it's normal, well, PA is highly unlikely. If it's abnormal with normal aldosterone, then you should go ahead and get that CT scan. If you've got a unilateral mass, that equals surgery. If you've got a bilateral mass, then you can proceed with bilateral AVS testing, which is really cool. We don't have time to get into it here, but it's uh, testing both the right uh, adrenal vein and the left adrenal vein for both aldosterone and cortisol and it's a whole lot of more mathematics and statistics and it's really cool but that then determines if that's going to be a surgical or pharmacological treatment plan and that's for your abnormal aldosterone renin ratio with normal aldosterone if it's if the aldosterone is elevated or you have that spontaneous hypokalemia or very low undetectable PRADRC. You go to the aldosterone suppression test, and if it's non-suppressible, go to the CT scan. If it's suppressible, then it's probably essential hypertension and not PA. If it's equivocal, you're going to repeat the suppression test in about three months. So here's our testing algorithm. I hope you got a lot out of this today. This presentation was to give you a review of the RAS system, to talk about the differences between the PRA Renin test and the DRC test, and then also talk about the age differences that we really need to be looking at and looking at our reference intervals and how those are being applied to patients. Remember, clinician education is key, regardless of which test you're doing, and you don't want to compare the two values together. So I was told to keep it to about 30 minutes, and we're at 28 and a half. So if you have any questions, I'll take them at this time. Well, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for your informative presentation. Um, we'll now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, can I use patient samples measured by PRA to evaluate a DRC assay? So the short answer is going to be no. Um, you, you can, by all means, use it as part of your validation, but uh, you're, you're measuring two completely different things. While, you know, they're, they're, they're both fruits, they're not both apples. So, um, yeah, you really need to, when you're validating a DRC assay, you, you need to measure it against uh, another DRC assay to validate your, uh, your testing. 
All right, thank you. Next question. Which physician groups use the ARR to screen for primary aldosteronism? Is this screen typically used by general practitioners or specialists? So unfortunately, it's most commonly used by specialists, which that brings in a whole host of issues. When you get into looking at who's ordering it, the specialists, especially in cardiology, and uh, cardiology rarely orders it, more endocrinology than anything else. But um, what the people who should be ordering this are your primary care providers, your family medicine, your internal medicine, uh, even OBGYN, as a lot of women use their OBGYNs as their primary care, they really should be looking for when they get that first um, elevated blood pressure and they're going, okay, this looks like you've got hypertension before they start them on any diet changes or any medication. That is the people who really should be ordering both aldosterone and renin and get the uh, ratio because once you've started on medication and once you've started on that low sodium diet, you really start running into interpretation issues. You know, you're, you're not going to get as accurate of a reading as you do with, with the patient being off of that diet and off of medication. So those are the, those are the ones who really should be using it and the ones who are using it, but by the time the patient gets to them, they're already on medication, so you've got a whole host of issues there. I see. Thank you. Um, next question. Do you have any comments about pro -renin? Um, I don't. Uh, it, it's not really utilized, and I, I don't really see where the clinical need is. It's, it's more of a research need at this time. Perhaps uh, as more research is done, you know, we might find a more clinical use for it, but currently um, there's not much clinical use for it. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. Do you prefer ARR in serum or plasma? Uh, so we prefer it in plasma. Um, it's that, that the, the reason that we prefer it in plasma is that you can spin that specimen very quickly and the faster that you can get that off the cells, the more stable that it is. Serum, it does have to clot uh, before you can then spin it and you start having some, some issues with the testing when you're, when you're looking at that serum. The, the quicker you can get that plasma, off of the red cells, the better your results are going to be. Okay. Uh, next question. Can you comment on repeat requests for renin and aldosterone testing? When might it be indicated? And any specific patient considerations, e.g. time of day? So there are times, uh, especially when you're doing, like I mentioned earlier, the AVS sampling, where you're going to do multiple aldosterones back to back while that patient is in a procedure. Uh, I have had a physician that wanted renins to be done on those as well. Uh, I think that was more for a research reason than it was for a clinical reason. But for doing multiple aldosterones in one day, that is a legitimate thing as part of the ABS protocol. Um, as far as doing them repeatedly, like every few days, if they did the first test and uh, they are really concerned about the patient potentially having PA, but then they found out afterwards that, oh, well, you know, the, the patient uh, was still taking their medicine and they didn't come off their medicine like they were supposed to, they may go ahead and repeat it. If the patient was on a low sodium diet and they didn't know that before, they may go ahead and repeat it. And then if you have someone who's kind of borderline and they're not really sure, they may repeat it, you know, after a few months to see if there is a change. Um, so there, there, there are some indications for repeating the testing. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. 
Can plasma renin activity assays be standardized the way that direct renin concentration assays can? So the short answer to that is no. Um, it would be very difficult to standardize plasma renin activity simply uh, because it is so labor intensive. Standardized assays, uh, the way that they could get them standardized is you eliminate as much of the variables as you possibly can. And right now, the way that those plasma renin activity assays, the way that they're performed, you, you simply can't. Uh, in order to get the, that CV has got to come down to even be able to try to standardize plasma renin activity. So for that reason, the DRC is more, more favorable. You've got, not only is it standardized, you have uh, less interlab variability. And because it is so much easier and it can be automated, you can bring it much closer to the patient. You can actually have it in your local labs instead of it only being a referral lab. And by getting those results back much faster, you can get patients treated much quicker as well. All right, great, thank you. Um, it looks like we have one more question. Um, and I, again, I encourage the audience, if you have any questions, please submit them. Um, we'll, we'll ask this question though, is it possible for antihypertensive therapies to interfere with the ARR? And if so, what should be done about it? So yes, antihypertensive therapies do interfere with uh, the ARR, both the aldosterone and the renin. There's a couple of things. One, like I've said before, you want to test before starting therapy. However, if you've got a patient that has already started therapy, you need to look at two options. One is that you take them off of therapy for at least seven days before doing the test. That's really a consideration that the clinician needs to make on a case-by-case -case basis and not do blanketly across patients. If you have patients who have severely uncontrolled hypertension and they would jump up into you know, 200 over 120, taking them off of their antihypertensives is not an option. The risk for that is, is too high. Uh, and those cases when you cannot take the patient off of their antihypertensives, really the best thing is to bypass the screen and go straight to uh, doing a stimulation test and looking for it that way. Um, that those are really your, your biggest options there. And it's really on a case by case basis. The clinician really needs to look at their patient and look to see, is it safe for me to take them off for seven days to see if I can do this or can we put them through a much more uh, time consuming and troublesome test of doing a stimulation test. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna be up to the clinician on a case by case basis. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Sure, so uh, as I did mention during the Q&A, the, the DRC is a test that can be automated. It can be done in your local labs. So uh, if there's any lab managers that are on here or lab directors, I would highly suggest that you look into those options you can um, you know, look and see what manufacturers do have that test available to bring in. Uh, here at my facility, we have brought in both aldosterone and direct running concentration, and we have an adrenal center here on site. There's only about five adrenal centers that are across the US, which means patients have to travel long distances in order to get that treatment. The more facilities that are able to bring this testing in-house, the more facilities are going to be able to open up their own adrenal centers so that patients can get the treatments that they need. All right, great. Um, and last minute, we have one more question. Um, 
I gather most patients do not have low potassium. Do you have any comments on this? Uh, so that that's really going to be in specific areas. Um, I know in our my own area here in Augusta, Georgia, we actually see a lot of uh, you know hypokalemia. It could be borderline, but um, that's that's really going to be kind of area dependent, and you're going to have to to look and develop your own. Uh, reference intervals with your own patient population in, in those aspects. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Gonzalez, for your time today and your important research. We would also like, and we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Diasorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.